What's going on, guys? It's Fancy Stock Exchange here, bringing you the third episode of the Dynasty 101 series we're doing over here at the Fancy Stock Exchange YouTube channel. And we're in rookie draft season, baby. All of you guys are starting your rookie drafts, have started, or your rookie drafts are coming up. And this video is going to be about the biggest mistakes that you can make in your Dynasty rookie drafts. Mistakes that, quite frankly, we've learned over the years, and that's why we're here to teach you. We're trying to pass this wisdom off to you guys. But before we get into the video, as always, Corey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah. The, this video, as is all the Dynasty 101 videos, is more macro based, but we are going to apply it directly to this draft class. So there's going to be, you know, some player analysis in this video. But yeah, like Danny said, these are five mistakes that we've seen our league mates make. We've made maybe ourselves uh, that we've learned are not, you know, the correct way to play Dynasty fantasy football. Again, anybody can play Dynasty any way that they want to. But if you're trying to win, if you're trying to, you know, collect the most value possible, these are the best ways that you can avoid, uh, you know, some pitfalls of dynasty fantasy football. Uh, before we get into this video, as always, if you guys enjoy this video, hit the like button, comment any of your thoughts down below, any rookie draft questions, dynasty questions, whatever. We will answer them and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Big thank you to you guys for getting us to 10,000 subscribers. We got there right before the NFL draft, which was our goal in the first place. So before we get into it, let's hit the intro. Okay, so mistakes to avoid. And if you guys want a real quick plug before we get into this, if you want our rookie draft rankings, they are available on Patreon, which is linked in the description, and uh, on Underdog Fantasy using promo code FSE at signup and first deposit. You'll get 100% match back from them. And you'll also get our Dynasty Rankings Manifesto for free. And Underdog just launched Best Ball Mania 3. It is an irresponsible amount of money in the prize pool. So if you want to get you know some skin in the game, chance to win, you know, $2 million to the, to the first place, 1 million to the second place, 500 K to the third place, irresponsible amount of money, promo code FSC at sign up at first deposit, seven figures in prize money. You guys do not want to miss out on that tournament. $25 entry for a chance to win $2 million. Sign me the frick up. Yeah. It's so good that me and Danny are going to travel multiple times this summer, just so we can be out of Ontario to do some of our own entries. But let's get into the five mistakes of rookie drafts that we're going to avoid. The first one is, you know, pretty straightforward. And this one's going to come into fruition a lot for a lot of you guys, because I'm sure you had your favorite prospects and certain landing spots that you wanted to see guys go to, but sticking to pre-draft biases is one of the biggest mistakes that you can make in rookie drafts. And this would apply directly to a guy like Malik Willis, who we thought was going to be, you know, potentially the 102 in rookie drafts, going to go in the first round, fell to the third round. The pre-draft bias would be that you thought he was a first round quarterback. He ended up slipping to day two, late day two as well. And also with a guy like George Pickens, who slipped a little bit in the draft due to some off the field concerns, uh, Isaiah Spiller, who went in the fourth round instead of day two, and any other quarterback, Desmond Ritter, Matt Corral, Sam Howell, whatever quarterbacks that you liked, they all pretty much slipped in the draft as well. So the reason you don't want to do this is because draft capital is the biggest information source that we get about these players, right? We can love, you know, whatever player we want. I love Sam Howell pre-draft. Guess what? He went in the fifth round. I have to change my tune. I have to pivot. I have to recognize that because he's a fifth round quarterback, the hit rate is very, very low. And even though I like the prospect, I have to pivot away from him, you know, anywhere before I would say the top 20, 24 picks in this rookie draft. Yeah. And I feel like uh, this comes to the fact that a lot of people will see, oh, well, the guy that was going, you know, 102 in my mock drafts prior to the NFL draft is now falling to me at 110. That's a screaming value. Wrong. Before the NFL draft, we assumed that Malik Willis was a Konami code round one draft capital insulation quarterback. The information we got from the NFL that he is, in fact, a third round 86th overall draft capital insulation quarterback. There is a big, big difference in hit rates. So, yeah, I mean, I love Malik Willis. I was one of his biggest supporters in taking him at the 102 in your drafts prior to the information the NFL gave us. The NFL told us this guy wasn't going until round three in our draft. He should not be a top 15, 18 type of pick in your rookie drafts. Now, if you want to take the shot on the upside at the late second, that's about where I would feel comfortable. But the 110 is just such a misappropriation of value. I mean, you're talking about Malik Willis over a 16th overall pick at wide receiver. Like that is just absurd. 
Right. And we don't know if this is necessarily how ADP is going to shake out. This was just the information that we got from sleeper a day after the NFL draft. So maybe it's, you know, taking some time to catch up, but either way, we're, you're going to see it in your leagues. If you guys are in multiple leagues, you're going to see Malik Willis still go in the late first round, early second round of your draft. And it's just too high. Frankly, he needs to go, you know, outside the top 15, top 18. If you're a rebuilding team and you have a lot of second round picks, by all means, take the shot on Malik Willis at the, you know, the 21st overall pick or something like that. But uh, it's got to take a big hit to his his uh, his overall outlook. And same goes for a lot of the guys that we didn't think were going to go super high in the draft that did, right? Like if we if you guys thought, oh, I don't really like Jahan Dotson. He's going to go, you know, in the second round of the NFL draft. I'll take him, you know, at the one, two turn, you know, mid second round of my rookie draft. Guy went 16th overall. Like that means something, right? The NFL and Washington specifically decided to take this guy in the top 20. Maybe you didn't like Chris Olave. He went 11th overall. Like that matters. Yes, and uh, it's funny you mentioned that because that all ties down into opportunity. We as fantasy players, like, yes, we want to spot the top talents in the league. But at the end of the day here, you need an opportunity. Like, we're talking about, as you mentioned, a, a third-round 86 overall quarterback. Do I think if Malik Willis got a chance to start eventually that he could be, you know, carve out maybe a Jalen Hurts type of career? Sure, but there are a lot of variables at hand there in terms of the opportunities that he could face. You're comparing that to the 16th overall pick, wide receiver Jahan Dotson. He is, whether you like it or not, going to step in immediately and be the wide receiver two of Washington's offense. Right, and he's going to get every opportunity to prove that. And we don't know situation-wise, this is a separate discussion specifically on Jahan Dotson, but we don't know situation-wise how it's going to play out. Is Carson Wentz going to be the long-term quarterback there? I highly doubt it, but it's possible. Is Terry McLaurin going to re-sign with Washington? Because that's also on the table. We have no idea. So take the 16th overall draft pick wide receiver, a wide receiver, in my opinion, who was a top five wide receiver in the class, and don't overvalue a third-round quarterback just because he was the 102 pre-draft. Uh, we have to get away from that you know, pre-draft bias. We want to stick to our pre-draft evaluations for the most part, but draft capital is the biggest input that we can get for these rookie prospects and for their future outlooks and how much opportunity that they're going to be seeing. And at, at third-round quarterback, has a very low chance of hitting. Go look at the, the previous year's third round quarterbacks. We got guys like Will Greer, Davis Webb, like guys that aren't like do not matter for fantasy whatsoever. Not necessarily saying that all these guys are going to be terrible, but we have to value uh, the guys that have first round opportunity, which is why both of us who weren't that high on Kenny Pickett have to value that he's a, the only first round quarterback in this class tethered to a top 20 pick and an offense that is going to give him every opportunity to succeed given the weapon score that they have. Yep. For sure. Uh, but either way, we can transition on to the next point, the next biggest mistake that we've noticed people in our leagues, people across Twitter, people across the fantasy industry making. I personally draft. made this mistake myself. Absolutely. Heck, I've made it in the past myself as well, is that we don't need to overvalue landing spot. Don't overvalue landing spot just because the RB5 of your rankings in the class, you know, goes 32nd overall to Kansas City doesn't mean you should be taking them in the first round of startups in the top two of your rookie drafts. And yes, if you guys have been playing dynasty fantasy football for a couple of years, you'll know exactly who I'm referring to with that statement. And it's probably one of the most notorious villains on the, on this channel. Right. Clyde Edward Teller went 101 in most drafts, maybe in super flex. People took Joe Burrow over him, but 101 Clyde Edward Teller was a thing. I didn't actually have the 101 any of those years, but I did trade it away. And had I had the 101, I would have made this mistake. I would have taken Clyde Edwards Hilaire over Jonathan Taylor, over you know Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, Jerry Judy, DeAndre Swift, all the guys that were expected to go way higher than him pre-draft. But because he went to Kansas City, he got elevated up boards. And not only him, but Keyshawn Vaughn was also a guy that got elevated up boards because of where he went as well. He went in the third round to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a team that people thought needed a running back. And, you know, it's Bruce Arians. He uses a workhorse. Everybody hyped up the situation, but failed to realize that Keyshawn Vaughn should have been a day three pick running back. And he was going ahead of, in most rookie drafts, a top 12 pick at wide receiver in Henry Ruggs. A guy like Michael Pittman Jr. picked at the top of the second round with a much better profile. T. Higgins, a guy with a much better profile, top of the second round pick. Brandon Ayuk, a first round wide receiver. All these guys should have went ahead of Keyshawn Vaughn back in 2020. And some of the guys that this applies to this year is Christian Watson going to the Green Bay Packers. Sky Moore to an extent, because I've seen people say that, you know, he's the 102 in drafts because he went to Kansas City. Sky Moore is a better prospect than what Clyde Edwards Hilaire was and even Christian Watson. And he's going to get elevated to some degree because he went to Kansas City. But we don't want to get crazy here. We don't want to take him over Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Traylon Burks, guys who are just superior prospects to him pre-draft. 
and a guy like James Cook, who also is going to get elevated by his landing spot in Buffalo. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that again. I really, really like Sky more the player. But if I see anybody out there on Twitter saying, well, he's a top three rookie pick now. He's Kansas City's wide receiver one. Stop that. Stop that. He is a very, very good prospect. He was actually, in fact, a top seven wide receiver for me coming into the draft. Obviously, luck of fortune, landed in a very great spot. But if you're taking him over the likes of Traylon Burks, Garrett Wilson, Drake London, I can hear your argument if you want to take him, you know, Olave over uh, Olave or Williams over Olave or Williams. But if you're taking him over Burks, London, or Wilson, please reevaluate. Yeah, exactly. And for Christian Watson, who I had as wide receiver 11 coming into the draft, yep. taking him over my wide receiver four pre draft in Jahan Dotson, who went 16th overall with, you know, t- a top 20 draft capital, would be a mistake. And maybe you weren't as high on Jahan Dotson as I was. Either way, you have to respect the fact that this guy was a top 16 pick. Christian Watson, a second round pick, questionable prospect profile, just because he got drafted to Green Bay doesn't make his prospect profile any less questionable. Um, A lot of people are going to overvalue some of these guys. Christian Watson and James Cook are probably the two that will get overvalued the most out of this rookie draft if I had to apply it to this. Now, that being said, where would I take these guys? I'm comfortable spending a late first round pick on Christian Watson. By late, I mean 111 or 112 and James Cook probably early second round. But if you guys start seeing some crazy shit of people taking Christian Watson 105, James Cook 108, that's where I got to draw the line. Yeah, and uh, I, I agree with that. Again, if you, for example, the ADP that was shown uh, with Watson and with uh, James Cook, you know, 112 and 109, that is typically on the low end of what I've been seeing. Like I've been seeing draft boards where Watson's going in the top five. I saw one where James Cook was the 103, which I mean, I don't think is applicable to many leagues, but let's just say, People are going to see Buffalo. People are going to see second round running back and vice versa with Christian Watson. People are going to see 34th overall pick Aaron Rodgers wide receiver one, and they are going to push these guys up the board. The mistake that you guys should be avoiding. Right. And especially considering that these guys were not, you know, bulletproof prospects. They were not guys that we were like, oh my God. Like as if, if Traylon Burks goes to green Bay and you want to take him one-on-one, no arguments here because Traylon exactly. Burks is a locked and loaded top three wide receiver in this class. But when you take a, a you know subpar prospect in Christian Watson in and put him into the Green Bay Packers, this is what's going to happen. People are going to overvalue him and not necessarily saying anybody out there is doing this in your leagues, but just be aware of it. The proper valuation for these guys, in our opinions, is a late first rounder for Christian Watson, early second rounder for James Cook. And if he goes you know significantly higher than that in your rookie draft, just be thankful that you didn't make that pick. And, and I'm sure uh, looking back to the 2019 draft that there were probably people out there that took McCall Hardman over A.J. Brown because, oh, I'm getting KC, I'm getting Patrick Mahomes versus, oh, Tennessee, they're going to run the ball. Like, what am I doing with A.J. Brown here? Right, and at the time, it was Marcus Mariota running the show. Things change quickly in the NFL. Yep. Aaron Rodgers could retire next year, right? And then suddenly it's not. Aaron Rodgers is number one wide receiver. He's Jordan Love's number one wide receiver or whoever takes over for Aaron Rodgers. So uh, especially at wide receiver, I would say do not overvalue landing spot because it is typically talent, opportunity, and the prospect profile. That matters more. So let's get into the next point here, which, yes. I mean, this is music to Danny's ears. Number three is overvaluing running backs. And the running back position is notoriously the most sexy position in fantasy football, even in super flex where quarterbacks have a lot of value you'll still see running backs go very, very high in your rookie draft simply because they're running backs. And the perfect example of this was back in 2019. Now let's ignore the fact that Nikhil Harry was the consensus 101. (laughs) But Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, and David Montgomery were the next three picks off the board. Now, Miles Sanders and David Montgomery specifically are the ones that I'm talking about. Josh Jacobs was a first-round running back, had all the opportunity in the world. I have no qualms with him being the 102 in that class. What I do have qualms with is Miles Sanders, who was a questionable prospect, Great athlete, but not a lot of production. People, you know, made excuses for him because he was behind Saquon Barkley at Penn State. And then David Montgomery, who didn't test as the greatest ass- greatest athlete and also was a third-round pick, going ahead of guys that we knew were great prospects like A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf and, you know, whatever wide receiver prospect that you liked in that draft. So, I mean, like, you're, you're talking about that, and it's funny looking at this because this is an inherent bias that the fantasy community's had for so long. People in their mother every time you ask about running back versus receiver the first response you're going to hear from somebody is oh there are so many good contributing wide receivers running back positional scarcity yada 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 don't do not take an inferior prospect just because he plays a position exactly and the thing that we want to do with that right let's say you have um you know Kenneth Walker on the board and Traylon Burks on the board in this in this draft class if you believe 
Again, make your own mistakes. It's your team. If you believe that Kenneth Walker is an equivalent prospect or close enough to Traylon Burks that it's okay to favor the running back in that position, by all means, go ahead. But what we don't want to be doing is taking a tier three running back over a tier two wide receiver. So let's say, for example, James Cook is on the board and Chris Olave is on the board. You should take Chris Olave because he is a better prospect. He was a tier two wide receiver in this draft class. James Cook is a tier three running back because I would argue that Brees Hall's in his own tier, Kenneth Walker's in his own tier, and then we have uh, James Cook, guys. Isaiah Spiller, whoever else that you have after that. Yep. No, I fully agree. And uh, it's funny because it says overvaluing running backs. Obviously, we can say like a, a position, but running backs are just the common denominator every time you're talking about an overvalued position. And I mean, that that carries over the redraft. Obviously, this is a more macro dynasty video, but we see running back ADP pushed up just because they are running backs. And if you guys have been following the channel, you'll realize that we are completely disagreeing with that mindset that a lot of the fantasy community holds. Right. And I think the, the important thing specifically about this draft class is that we have to face reality. This running back class wasn't Sucked. good. The yes. strength of this class was wide receivers. So eight of the top 10 picks, nine of the top 12 picks, 10 of the top 12 picks should be wide receivers because they're the better prospects. Quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends. This class stunk for those positions. Yep. No, uh, I fully agree. So off of that, we can transition into the next point and kind of something that goes into overvaluing running backs. I feel like a lot of people will push these running backs up the board because the common denominator for every single person is I need running backs. I need running backs. I need running backs. Drafting for need in May is the biggest Fugazi you can do in your dynasty drafts. And yes, I don't say that lightly. You do not need to fill out your roster in May. Bush, when is opening day this uh, this year? September 8th, 9th, 7th, something like that, probably. So that's when you need to fill out your roster. That's when you need to have a lineup for. Why are we worried about that in May? Are we right. playing and games in May? Are we no, playing games not. in June, July, August? No. Yeah, so, and I mean, especially if you're contending, right? Because people, if they're a contender, they might be thinking about their starting lineup, their depth, et cetera. They're trying to win a championship this year. And here's a hypothetical contending roster. This is not a real league. We don't have this team in any leagues. I just filled out a hypothetical contending roster in need of a running back because running backs typically get overvalued. This is how you want to properly handle this situation. You have the 111. So this means, let's say you finished second place last year. You're really eager to win that championship. You want to take James Cook, let's say, at the 111 to put your team over the top. But Jamison Williams fell to you, right? People are nervous about the ACL tear, maybe whatever the case is. He fell to you and he is a tier two wide receiver, maybe even a tier one wide receiver, depending on who you talk to. When you're on the clock and you see that Jamison Williams is on the board, and James Cook is on the board, and that's who you're deciding between, always lean with the better prospect. You can figure the rest of the shit out later. And what Danny's about to say is be creative when you're on the clock. If you have the 111 and you don't want to take Jamison Williams, go ask your league mates, come get Jamison Williams. Who wants Jamison Williams? I am looking for a running back. Trade that pick away. Let's say Antonio Gibson is the guy that you want to trade him away for because Antonio Gibson just got Brian Robinson added to his backfield. You might say to the Antonio Gibson manager who needs a wide receiver and likes Jamison Williams, I will give you my 111 and my 211 or my 311, whatever that needs to get it done for Antonio Gibson. You could come up and draft Jamison Williams. Exactly. I mean, you kind of took the words out of my mouth. You were saying like Danny was about to say that. Yes, I'm about to say that. There are two ways. You either take the best player available and you're happy with it and you could figure it out. Again, we don't play until September. Your rookie drafts in early May. You have three months to figure out that running back spot. Go nuts. Take the value. Or B, as you kind of mentioned, when you are on the clock, gauge your league's interest. Be creative, work a deal. Maybe you say, okay, no, listen, the guy who has DeAndre Swift also has, you know, Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, and I don't know, fucking Javante Williams. And maybe, you know, the 111 and my future first and, you know, my 211 maybe gets it. Let's just say hypothetically. Like, be creative, make offers. Most of you guys are in a slow draft for a reason. Most people I know are in a slow draft, but if you're in a fast draft, even still gauge your league interest, gauge your league market. And if you aren't creative when you're on the clock, if you're not sending out offers, if you're not kind of seeing how your league values this pick as opposed to how you value it, you're doing it wrong. Just taking a player because, oh, I need a running back. James Cook's the next running back. Therefore, I go James Cook. is just such a old philosophy of thinking. The biggest advantage you can have in Dynasty is being proactive is being creative, is making these offers. Because quite frankly, you're going outside of your box. You're going outside of the box to create value opportunities for yourself. 
Right, exactly. And this, like Danny said, there's multiple ways you can do it. You could do what I just said, go trade for a veteran running back instead of drafting Jamison Williams and dangle that piece in front of him. Worst case scenario, you just draft Jamison Williams and, you know, come out August, later. September, whatever. Yep. You trade Devontae Smith away for a running back. You trade Stephon Diggs away for a running back on this hypothetical roster. Or Absolutely. like Danny said, you could also go, hey, I have James Cook rated as my next rated running back. I don't feel comfortable taking James Cook until, let's say, these, th these three wide receivers and Kenny Pickett are off the board. I'm going to trade down to 202, 203, 204 to get maybe James Cook isn't there, but maybe I still get Isaiah Spiller, who I have ranked closely. Or Pierce. Or Pierce or Algier, whatever. Yeah. You trade down from your 111 to the 204. You get yourself, let's say, a veteran running back like James Conner on top of it. Like, yeah. you can make moves like that. Be, pre, uh, be creative, be proactive, see what you can do. Maybe you can trade your pick straight up for a veteran. Maybe you can trade down, get a similarly rated prospect at a better value. Maybe you just take the best player on the board and trade one of your veterans for a running back later. You can do a lot of things in Dynasty, and hopefully you're playing in a league that is very active as well. And that kind of transitions into my next point in that, a lot of people you'll, you'll see, they have, you know, they'll print out their rankings, they'll put out their rankings, they'll say, hey, Twitter, what are your thoughts? These are my rankings. And sometimes you'll just see something that really, really sticks out like a Sora. I mean, if we're talking about it, maybe somebody has James Cook as their 105 in the class. My next point is don't try to outsmart the market. Try to exploit it. So many people I see from a micro player analysis standpoint try to put a player way above market value because they're trying to, you know, go out on a limb or trying to look smart, whatever. We are playing a game of probabilities. We are playing a game of range of outcomes. If you have, you know, let's say Christian Watson as your 103, and kind of goes back into our point. If you have Christian Watson as your 103, and you know his market value for the most part is going to be around the 108, the 109, do not take him at 103. Do not take him over uh, guys like Garrett Wilson, guys like Traylon Burks, guys like Kenneth Walker, which for the majority of your drafts are going to go uh, in that top five. Trade down. Like people are so focused on being ahead of the market, being ahead of the curve, you know, being right about something that they don't understand it. And I'll show a graph actually, or Corey will show a graph or whoever uh, goes on with this uh, on this video in particular. But Adiko FF actually tweeted this out, but it's basically probabilities based off where you're drafting, where you should expect certain players to be. So again, I, I mentioned, I mean, maybe you think Tyler Algier is going to be, you know, the RB3 in this class, and he would comfortably be a first round pick for you. Let's just say hypothetically, do not take him high. Understand where he is relative to the market around him and adjust your pick so that you're in a more appropriate range to take that player. And it, it kind of alludes back to a comment from yesterday on the live stream is that somebody said, you know, Kenneth Walker is my RB1 in this class. Well, the market actually values as Brees Hall being a tier above any other player in this class. If you genuinely believe that Kenneth Walker is the RB1 in this class, get 102 plus for the 101 and then take Walker. Don't take Walker at 101 because then you're losing value. Yeah, exactly. And don't, don't get too cute with it, obviously, because we have ranked Kenneth Walker ranked at 105. They'll be like, okay, FSC has it at 105. I think Kenneth Walker is the 101, so I'm going to trade down from 101 to 105, and I'm still going right. to get Kenneth Walker. Because you don't want to miss out on that player either. You want to trade down maybe a little bit ahead of where he's going exactly. just to make sure that you get that guy, but make sure that you're doing that, right? If you have a big discrepancy, like Danny said, let's say you have the 103 and the 109 in your rookie draft, and you have Christian Watson rated as your 103, and you want to just take him there, no, trade down. Maybe he's going to fall to your 109, but maybe if you don't want to risk it, trade down to 108 or 107 or something like that to or make sure that you get that guy because at least at that point, you're not taking him at 103. Yeah, or trade up for 109, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I am fine if, you know, your 201 ranked player is usually going at like the 206 and you want to, you know, take him at 201. That is not an issue for me. My issue is that when there's such big value discrepancies between especially that top of the order of your rookie drafts, like don't just ignore market value. Because at the end of the day here, Dynasty is a long-term game. Dynasty is a value accumulation game. If you want to do player X versus player Y, go play redraft. Yeah, exactly. And I think the, the underrated thing about this too is that you can do your own market research in your DMs, in your league chat. You can go reach out to the guy who has, let's say you're, you want Christian Watson 
and you have the 105, but you don't want to pick him that high. You you think he'll be there at 109, and you talk to the guy who was the 106, and you're like, hey, who are you you know leaning towards? I'm thinking about trading down. I want to know if my guy is still going to be there. And he's like, hey, I'm dead set. I'm a you know a Jets fan, and Garrett Wilson is going to fall to me, so I'm going to take Garrett Wilson. Or you know I'm a I'm a diehard Lions fan, so I'm going to take Jamison Williams or something like that, right? You can manipulate the market without them even really knowing it, right? You could just kind of ask them who they're going to pick, and they're probably going to tell you, and you'll know for sure then. I'm going to trade down from 105 to 109. I'm going to get, you know, James Conner on top of it in the third round pick to help my contending window. And I'm still going to get the guy that I wanted at 105. For sure. And you're going to pick up on these certain little micro tendencies in your own league. You're going to know, especially if you're playing, let's just say in your home league, you're going to know how a lot of your friends think. If a lot of your friends are, you know, in redraft leagues, pounding three straight running backs to start their draft and they're picking 102, you know, most likely that they're probably going to go with Kenneth Walker at 102. Yeah, exactly. So, um, again, we were, this is like a, a really fun topic for us. This is yeah. rookie mistakes. Again, we we've made these mistakes. We've, we've tried to outsmart the market rather than exploit it. I took Henry Ruggs in a dynasty start or in a dynasty rookie draft at one Oh eight, a couple years ago when I could have very easily gotten him in the early second round. And I wanted to look smarter than everybody. I wanted to be the guy that said, Hey, Henry Ruggs was my wide receiver one. So I want to take Henry Ruggs at one Oh eight. Guess what? I passed on Justin Jefferson and I had the two Oh one in that draft. So I could have taken Justin Jefferson and still probably gotten rugs at 201 or at the very least traded up from that 201 to secure him. Yep. No, absolutely. So uh again, you guys would have seen uh the odds, if you will, on you know your favorite players making it to certain picks. Use that to your advantage. Use the market to your advantage. Be able to navigate your rookie draft to land in pockets of picks that either represent a final player in a tier or value spots that you can exploit later on. Yeah, exactly. And a couple guys that stand out to me this year is I see Jahan Dotson, top 16 overall pick wide receiver, sliding to the second round sometimes, let alone, you know, the 111, 112, where I think he's still a great value there. But I've seen him in the second round. And yeah. David Bell, who went third round, tied to Deshaun Watson for the next couple of years, is going, you know, middle of the second, 206, 207, mm -hmm. behind guys that went in the fifth round. As much as I like Tyler Algier, he's a fifth round running back. Like he should not be going ahead yeah. of a third round rookie wide receiver who had a great prospect profile going to an elite offense potentially. Yep. No, I fully agree with you there. But either way, about 30 minutes into this video, if you guys have enjoyed so far, if you've enjoyed this, you know, macro market-based type of idea, which we bring the heat on with Dynasty 101, make sure you leave a like down below. And again, we crossed 10,000 subscribers last week prior to the NFL draft. It's road to 11K, baby. It's road to 12K. It's road to 13K. We just want to keep and keep growing and keep and keep increasing the overall genuine feel of this community. I mean, we are building up a great discord. We're building up a great comment section. We love interacting with you guys and man, I love it here. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, leave a comment. We will answer it. We pretty much answer every single yep. comment that we get. And uh, like Danny said, subscribe to the channel. If you're new as well, check out the Patreon. If you're interested in rookie rankings and you want those uh, to be better prepared for your rookie drafts, we never plug this, but we also do consultations too. So if you're completely you know, um, you have no idea where to go with any of your picks and you want our personalized advice specific to your league market, we can hop on a Zoom call with you and talk yep. about your league market and, you know, where you should go with your draft picks. And uh, uh, that's super fun. We've done a bunch of those this off season and we always really appreciate those. So those are available via Google form in the description as well. Yep, for sure. But uh, either way, hope you guys enjoyed. Peace out.